the executive director uh, and co-founder of the Woodstock Film Festival, and she's going to be introducing the next panel. Thank you, Hope. <clears throat> and hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again so much for coming. Um, this is uh, so great to have you here. This is the very, very, very last panel of the 20th anniversary of the Woodstock Film Festival. So I will welcome these panelists with sadness because I will not be here again this year to welcome more panelists. But I do have to say that the panels at the festival are truly are among my favorite things because, you know, somebody said films you can see anywhere. Well, that's not true because so many of the films that we bring to the Woodstock Film Festival, actually, you cannot see anywhere else because so many independent films do not get wide release, and you can see them only in certain film festivals, or sometimes even at one film festival. However, with people, with panelists, when you bring all these special individuals who are so accomplished in their fields, whether they're directors or actors or producers or screenwriters, together to talk about their craft, to talk about their goals and dreams and also the, the, the trajectory of their careers, that does not happen again. I mean, that group of people may never be, be sitting together again on a panel. So that it really is a, a unique opportunity and I'm so, I feel privileged that the Woodstock Film Festival can bring so many accomplished people together at the festival year after year. And, um, uh, th this panel is, the Woodstock Film Festival stands for so many things and uh, socially relevant issues, issues that affect our lives and activism and filmmakers as activists or filmmakers as game changers. It's really part of our DNA. So um, without further ado, I would like to bring John Bowermaster, who is the right now on his laptop, but... <laughs> He's going to be moderating this panel, which is trending issues. We really will highlight filmmakers as um, those who bring issues that affect our lives to the, to the, to the light so that for all of us to, to, to learn from and be inspired by, and uh, hopefully also sometimes be called for action. So John Bowermaster, welcome. And I would like to bring the panelists, Barbara Koppel and Clemma. And, um, and 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 um, Cheryl, Cheryl McDonough, can you join me, please, also? And who are we missing? We're missing one more person here. Peter Nelson. Peter Nelson. <laughs> I told you. Last but definitely not least, Peter Nelson. They all have films at the festival, and thank you all so much for being a part of uh, this panel. And uh, John Bowermaster, take it away. Thank you, Mira. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you there, is, there is something. Thank you for doing the 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I know this was. So thank you, Barbara Koppel, for coming to the Woodstock Film Festival. <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew you wouldn't let me get away with it. <laughs> okay, Barbara Koppel, two times Academy Award winning oh, filmmaker. God. Been to the Woodstock Film Festival ever since 2000, all the way until 2019. She never missed a year. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Barbara. I couldn't stop coming. <laughs> Thank you, Mira. And I know this was pur purposeful. I know you saved the best for last, right? Uh, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves because if I do it, I'm just kind of mimicking something off of a page, and I think it's more interesting if they kind of make up their own biography. Um, I'm going to preface that, though. I haven't been for 20 years, but I have been for 10 years. And we're going to talk about trends and themes, et cetera. And I went back and, and looked at the films that I've shown here going back over 10 years and tried to see if there was a trend and theme in my own work. And, and there's a relevance to it. But I'll, I'll give you the short list. I think in 2010, we showed uh, Louisiana Water Stories, was about, which was about environmental issues in, along the coast of Louisiana. 2012, we showed Dear Governor Cuomo, uh, which was very fun in, in large part because Mira didn't see it before it aired, before it screened. 
and then we showed a 3D movie, Antarctica on the Edge, at the Kingston Mall, which was sold out a couple shows, which was fun. And then after the spill, that was 2015, that was our follow-up to the Louisiana story. Uh, and 20, also in 2015, Paradise is There, which is a biopic of Natalie Merchant, which was also another film that Mira didn't see before we screened it. Uh, and then last year we showed Ghost Fleet a couple times about the global plight of fishing slaves. And the relevance there is, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there is a theme or a trend other than a lot, they, there is kind of an environmental backdrop in, in all of or most of the stories. But beyond that... And you're that, a good filmmaker. Yeah, thank you. But just, you know, I, I, we're going to get into this notion of, of what, you know, do, do, do we individually have our own trends or do we just do... I kind of feel like I just make films as they come about. You know, I, there's no predicting. I can't tell you what I'm going to do five years from now or mm -hmm. 10 years from now. But Cheryl, maybe I'll let you introduce yourself. And is there a theme in your work? Uh, mm, good question. Well, um, so my name is Cheryl Horner McDonough. And uh, I have been producing, directing, writing. I wear different hats uh, with different projects. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years, so since my fifth birthday. Um, uh, I, I actually produced a lot of content in the past um, for MTV. I kind of think that that's where I grew up and see a couple of my uh, teammates here, actually three who all worked with me at MTV. Um, so I would say for me, the only, uh, the, the, if there's one theme, it's, um, it's documentaries about young people. Uh, I think that's always been of interest to me. So uh, issues that affect young people, uh, issues that young people are interested in, and that can be a, a, a myriad of, of topics, um, but I would say that is the only theme. The, the film that I am here with now does fall into that category, and that is called Parkland Rising. Uh, and that's about the uh, student activism that arose from the tragedy, the shooting of 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, last February, February 2018. Uh, so that's, that's what we just screened here for the, the first and second time ever, so I don't blame you if you haven't seen it, um, but thank you for uh, having us. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so I'm Barbara Koppel, and I've been making films for a very long time, even though it doesn't feel that way. Each time I do a new film, it's like the first time, and I get excited. Or if somebody calls me up and said, how would you like to do a film on Miss Sharon Jones? I'm like a 12-year-old, so excited to, and curious to start on something wonderful. Uh, the first film I showed here, I guess, was My Generation. It was about the three Woodstocks and the film that I just showed today in Rhinebeck and yesterday at um, Upstate Theater here on Tinker Street is called New Homeland, and then one in between for all these years. But New Homeland was very significant to me. It was a passion project, and it was something that I really wanted to do. It's about refugees and how fantastic Canada is in taking care of its refugees and sponsoring them. And it's a story about three families, two Syrian and one Iraqi family. And you learn at the beginning about all the horrors that they went through. And then the boys get sponsored to go to summer camp. And they learn about paddling and tripping and portage and making new friends that are American and Canadian and parents that don't want them to leave because they've never been separated from them. And, it's just so universal. And I just wanted to do something that was filled with love and filled with hope. So. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Clement Gerard, French name. So I'm Clement for you guys, or most of you. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be amongst those panelists. Uh, unlike Barbara, I haven't done that for a very long time. 
I've done that for a very short time. That's my first film. So we w did our world premiere on Friday. It's a documentary film called The Condor and the Eagle. Oh. And well, um, regarding jumping in right away about themes and is there like any um, choice in what we have done. Yeah, sure. We were interested in doing a documentary about environment, not even documentary, we wanted to do a very short piece with my wife, the co-director, Sophie, uh, who is German. And uh, we were um, targeting environmental issues in the US. Uh, little did we know that we would actually go for a five years uh, project and documenting how indigenous women uh, are the true leaders of the climate justice movement globally. And uh, that's been absolutely crazy to just uh, stay open to whatever comes our, our way. So I think what was key in our success, because the success is just to finish the film, <laughs> and um, it was just to not like have too many expectations, but just stay open to uh, what was coming and uh, maybe along the way burn part of our ego, you know, the European self-absorption and sense of entitlement. And uh, that's what indigenous uh, spirituality is about, you know, is to rediscover our, interconnected, our interconnectedness with each other and with the natural world. So I stop here. The storyline, just very quickly, is like four indigenous women leaders from uh, Canada and the US traveling to the Amazonian, Amazonian rainforest and build the alliances they need to take the climate justice movement globally. So thank you for having me here. All right. And Clément, Clément, what did you do prior to making this film for five years? What led you to filmmaking? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I have a master's degree in sociology, anthropology, I did uh, international marketing management in London. I did technical support in Ireland. I cleaned toilets in Germany. <laughs> I worked in a hotel. I did many stuff, yeah. But uh, that was good, so that it would flex. Oh, that's, a, that's a classic path to f documentary filmmaking. Oh, you think so too? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I read the manual, step-by-step -step guide to you know. yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, Peter Nelson, and uh, uh, our film is the, the Pollinators, which is a film that I directed and photographed and with, uh, produced with my wife, Sally Roy, who's right out there. Um, and we're, we're local here to Accord, um, and we've been here since the first year as well uh, for the film festival, so we're kind of here. Um, and it's a thrill to be here with, uh, with this film. It's uh, the first film that I've directed, first feature film that I've directed, and, um, and it's about bees and our food system where I followed um, migratory beekeepers around the United States as a way to talk about the problems with bees and our food system. And we've had just an unbelievably good reception to it, I think because people know that there's a problem with bees and it affects every one of us every day. Um, and uh, so we're just having a great time. I'm thrilled to be here. And um, I, uh, I'm a cinematographer, is what my day job is. And so I've been lucky enough to work on great films with other people, including Barbara, um, it, and my generation. So it's, it's great to be here, and I'm just honored. So thank you. Hey, yeah, I would just chime in. I think we're really privileged to be with this rather select group of filmmakers. Um, I'm going to uh, skip back one, one step before we, because I think it will identify this notion of, of trending. And maybe, maybe you can just tell, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got into this particular film. You know, how, how, how you and why you with, with Parkland Rising. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, the honest answer is I'm a parent of three teenagers, and I am originally from Florida. Um, I, when the shooting at uh, the high school happened in February 2018, I reacted like everyone else, I think. I, I was horrified, and you know, but it, these shootings keep happening all over the country all the time. Um, what caught my attention was the way that the 
uh, the, the youth activists reacted. It was that they immediately, they were so angry and passionate and they were so articulate and they were so right. And I uh, just felt like I have to do something. I have to, I have to find a way to help. And the, the skill that I have, the, the thing that I do is, is make these documentaries. I can tell people stories. So I felt like if I could uh, tell their story, it might help uh, create more momentum and keep a spotlight on the issue. So I would say this is the first time I ever felt like um, through uh, my craft, this is the first time I actually felt like I became an activist. Um, I never felt that way before. Well, that, that don't 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 let us forget that because that's something I want us to explore I mean, further is that notion of filmmaking as filmmakers as activists. When when does that where does that line stop and and stop? Barbara, how did you get into the Canadian story? What was your introduction? Uh, well, as I said, um, I wanted to do something that really showed um, how wonderful Canada was and helping refugees. And we were looking all over for something to do. And one of the people I work with who became a producer on the film named Eric Foreman had gone to this camp, Camp Pathfinder, in the middle of nowhere, um, three, hour, three and a half hours north of Toronto, no running water, no electricity, except in the dining room. And you bathe in the lake, which was freezing and sleep in sleeping bags and, you know, really beautiful going back to nature. And he went to a college reunion and one of the other guys who went to Pathfinder said, you know, remember when we went to Pathfinder for one or two years? And Eric said, of course, you know, we were both very young and, you know, and he said, well, I just heard that the head of Pathfinder, Mike Sladden, is going to sponsor two Syrian families and one Iraqi family to come to camp. And Eric's eyes lit up and he called me and he said, I have the best news. And he raced back um, to New York and we called Mike Sladden thinking, oh, he's gonna be overjoyed that we're coming to this all boys camp. And so we asked him, we made our pitch and he said, absolutely not. He said, I don't want to ruin the experience for anyone. So a few weeks went by, and finally we wore him down. And he is so glad that he did that. He's using the film for fundraising. The film had um, its world premiere in Toronto. Uh, and there were three screenings. It was six or 700 people in the theater, which was amazing, and it was full. And it, the families all came to see the film, and they'd never seen the film before. And so they're there. And so after the film, I had to beg some of them to come up on stage, and the boys were shy and sort of looked into their microphones and I asked one of the fathers, you know, what do you think? He said, I just can't talk about it. Okay. The next night showed it again and the boys raced to the to the stage. The parents raced to the stage and everybody couldn't stop talking. And one of the fathers said, this is one of the best days of my life. One of the women said, I've never seen a film on a screen before. And it was just one of the most rewarding things, I think, that I've done to get that response. The boys poured their hearts out, you know, about what this film meant to them. And some of them were going back to camp. And it was wonderful. And, but yeah. when, 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 you, when you were looking, were you looking for a story of hope? Were you looking for something more yeah. positive or optimistic well, to do? Well, I was looking for whatever happened, but I wanted to show warts and all. I mean, there's, you know, one member of the group who was a young boy, and he was having, you know, very severe problems um, because his father was murdered. He lived in Turkey 
you know, with his single mom and his brother, and he was in gangs there and trying to survive. And so when he came to camp, he was very rough on everybody, and they had to send him home early because he was a threat to some of the young lives. And he was the only one who didn't come to the screening uh, because they didn't know what he would do or how he would respond. And he lives in a group home now. So it wasn't as if it was all, you know, roses and wonderful. It was just real. It was just universal of how we all, you know, try to protect our children and how we all you know, get bullied and how we all try to make friends and how scared we are sometimes to try things for the first time. So it was, it's a very real film. And, and did you, <clears throat> did you, you were looking for a story in Canada because of what's going on regarding to immigration in the, in the United States? Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, show the love of these families and these kids and what it was all about and see if there's anything we can do, show this film in schools everywhere to show that, you know, refugees are not strangers. We can't hold them at arm's length. We have to embrace them and to struggle. Here, you know, the kids here are put in cages and the kids there are sent to a beautiful summer camp. And Clément, why indigenous peoples from Can also starting in Canada through the United States all the way to the Amazon? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sorry, I, I've not seen the film. Uh, it's the four same persons that you follow, or is it different persons? Okay, so uh, first of all, yeah, you know, you came to Canada, Barbara. Yes. And uh, you found the story. I did. Well, I knew yeah. that they were coming. You knew. So I okay. Was lucky. That's okay. So I really believe that there is like some kind of synchronicity happening very often. You know, if your intentions are right, you know, you are gonna find the right opportunity. So uh, when we arrived in the U.S. Uh, with Don, my wife, we had no clue what we wanted to do. So the best way was just to rent a van. But so, let, let me go back one second. What, what do you mean you had no idea what you wanted to do? You arrived to do something. Yeah, we wanted to just get information about uh, environmental issues in the US. Period. That's what, that was the starting point. Exactly. OK. Yeah. And then we saw, so uh, on Friday, uh, came with me for three days, this amazing uh, indigenous elder, Casey Camp Hornick from the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma. Um, and I, we were in New, uh, Washington, D.C., and I saw her step on the stage for the Cobio, Cowboys and Indian Alliance. So it was the Cowboys and the Indians coming together uh, in order to uh, build the very unlikely alliances between the, the oppressors and the oppressed, basically, uh, in order to be more effective in the struggle and the fight against climate change. And uh, when I saw Casey, I, saw I said to my wife, Sophie, we are going to work with her. And she was like, eh, yeah, you're crazy, whatever. <laughs> and um, so we rented a van. We didn't even speak to her. She was too impressive. So we, we rented a very small van. Imagine one year and a half with your wife in a van or your husband. Husbands were difficult, too. <laughs> And um, so we went from one community to the next, to the next like that for the first six months. And we would do lead interviews with indigenous people that would told, told us, you know, you should go and um, drive 800 kilometers this direction and speak to John. <laughs> and we're like, all right, let's go. <laughs> and uh, we did that repeatedly until we ended up in the Tar Sands region. It's the largest industrial project in the world in northern Canada. It's absolutely devastating over there. And uh, it all made sense, you know? We traveled from New York to Houston, Texas, to San Francisco, all the way up uh, to Canada. And then we understood that it was, or those uh, issues were linked so we started having a sense of, like, okay, you know, those issues are linked. And we had a sense that indigenous people were bringing something very deep in the way we can, you know, like bring a movement to flourishing. 
And we had the sense as well, there was a social movement in the rise. So we finally selected our key people, key protagonists, and then one of the ladies from the Tar Sands told us, you should come to us, you know, there's an, in New York, there is a march that's gonna take place. I was like, all right, let's go. There was like half a million people in the streets in New York for the People's Climate March. And you know what? Two of the four protagonists, they were on the front row, followed by half a million people. But we had no clue that we actually had selected the protagonists that would actually lead symbolically, emotionally, and spiritually a movement that is now, you know, like global. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. No, that's yeah. a great origin story. I'm sure you'll, you're going to a dozen festivals in October. I'm sure you'll tell that story <laughs> more than once. Yeah, I learned it by heart. <laughs> and Peter, you, you neglected to, to mention that, that you come to this beekeeper story in part because you are a? Beekeeper. Beekeeper. But the film, The Pollinators, is, is about more than bees. I mean, how, how do you sub describe its kind of bigger picture, so to speak? Yeah, so, so I am a beekeeper for a little over 30 years, um, and um, of course I have a great fascination with bees, but then um, I wanted to connect. There are a lot of problems that are happening to bees, and when I found out about or researched about this group of migratory beekeepers that move massive amounts of bees around uh, at a level that I didn't quite understand um, initially to agriculture across the United States and how dependent our food system um, is to those bees and beekeepers. And they're, I was drawn to them because they're great characters. Um, they're kind of like uh, ranchers and cowboys and truckers all kind of wrapped up in one. And they're often family businesses and they move these uh, bees by semi-truck, um, thousands of semi-truck around the United States and they move two million beehives into almonds, for example, which are almost 100% uh, pollinated by bees that uh, they cannot live there the rest of the year. And so I, I wanted to, to take sort of my knowledge of, um, of bees um, and my work as a cinematographer and kind of combine those with a great passion for food and agriculture and, and that's how it all kind of wound up together. Um, and uh, it's, it was, it's, I sort of tell people it's kind of like the really important story that most people don't know they need to know. Um, and then a big part of it for me was also that it was, a story that I thought that there might be solutions hidden in it uh, that everybody can do. And I was really drawn to that, to have something, a topic that was actionable, that people could really go out and do things to make it better. And I really believe that. And I think that that's something that we try to bring to audiences, the fact that everybody can make a difference in this really important topic and of uh, pollinator decline. Okay. <laughs> Did, did you guys know that there are semi-trucks out there loaded with bees traveling across the country and parked at rest stops? And Yeah, so just as a, uh, so they bring two, in, in almonds, I'll use that because it's the most extreme example, but they're basically a million acres of almonds in the Central Valley of California, and they need to bring in two million bee hives uh, for that pollination. And so it's, it works out to be somewhere around 6,000, 8,000 semi-trucks of bees that need to move bees in there for a five to six week period, and then they go from there to other crops, uh, apples and uh, blueberries, cranberries, pumpkins, up and down the east and west coast and through the Midwest of the United States. And it's because agriculture is begot has gotten a lot more simplified um, chemically and then also more monocultures of certain crops that the this dependence has grown for these beekeepers to come in, the farmers bring the beekeepers in as kind of a form of an insurance, if you will, to ensure pollination, because if you don't have pollination, you don't have a crop. And the decline of native bees, which goes along with habitat loss, pesticide use, uh, lack of uh, um, uh, good nutrition, uh, that you need to bring bees in to do this because the native populations aren't there in sufficient numbers to achieve it. So the beekeepers are really responding to the changes in agriculture that is driven by us culturally and on how we consume and purchase our food. So e each of you have made a really powerful and beautiful and, and heartfelt uh, film.
Barbara, would, do you ever, or would you identify yourself as an activist? Uh, I think what I try to do in my work is to tell really compelling stories and allow you, the viewer, to decide which way you're gonna go. I'm not an I gotcha kind of filmmaker. Um, but of course, <laughs> I have my own persuasions and that always makes it into the film. So yes, I mean, I guess I'm definitely an active, an activist, I'm a storyteller, I'm a filmmaker who just loves so much what I'm doing and loves so much to dig deeply into who people are and why they do things. Um, one of the films that I did, you know, quite a while ago was a film called Gunfight. I saw it. You did? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, anyway, and I did all sides of it to let you, the viewer, understand. I was at NRA conferences. I was where they were selling guns. I filmed Colin Goddard, who was one of the survivors of um, Virginia Tech. I filmed, you know, people who keep guns in their apartment and um, under beds in the kitchen, everywhere, and it was really very eye-opening for me. I also did an environmental film uh, for Discovery about drought and about how these farmers who plant every single thing that we eat are suffering terribly and through the water shortage. So, you know, I've sort of been in the laps a little bit of all of the issues that we're covering on this panel. And, and Cheryl, with, with, with your new film, Parkland Rising, I mean, what is the expectation, whether yours or the people you interviewed, filmed, what is the expectation for how the film can hopefully or potentially make a difference? Mm. Um, so I'm actually really optimistic that, uh, that it, it can have an impact. Um, if you see the film, I, I think you understand what the, the people involved went through. You, um, you will suffer some of their suffering. You, you kind of can't walk away without uh, experiencing a little bit of the, the trauma, um, but you then understand what they are fighting for and you see exactly what they are fighting against. We show a lot of that. Uh, we show the opposition, we show the, um, the, the nasty things that people say, the nasty things that, that happen in person, the uh, actual death threats and things like that. Um, and I believe that by the end of the film, you will feel inspired to take some kind of action. Um, and so I, I do think that it's possible for a film uh, if seen by enough people to uh, to make an impact. You know? Is there a call to action? So there's not a specific list of here's what you can do, although I think that will be helpful if uh, you know it, it goes out to college campuses and high schools and so on, because I do find that even in the two screenings we have here, that's the first thing people say is, you know, they've been through this and that's exactly what they want to know. What can I do? Yeah. So I think... Uh, it's, it's largely post-November uh, 2016, in my experience, at screenings, is people even more than ever before want to know what can I do, yes. because I think there is this feeling that in November of 2016, too many people sat on their hands and... Yes didn't do anything yes. or didn't do what one simple thing. Yes, vote. and I didn't want to make a film that leaves you feeling you know, sad and beaten down uh, and like you've been through something, but, but you, you know, you've just suffered and now what? You know, that's, that's not it. It is about showing you uh, the path that they have illuminated and, and showing you how you can uh, be a part of it, be a part of the solutions, be a part of the change. That's really the whole point. And I actually do think it's possible, or I wouldn't have, uh, you know, put myself out there. <laughs> well, that, my, my next kind of line of thinking is, you know, I want to continue this talk about, act, you know, filmmakers as, as activists, but I also am curious about, 
I'm a big believer that media can make a difference. Good media can make a difference. Actually, bad media can make a difference too. <laughs> but, uh, but I say that with a cautionary anecdote. Um, we made a film, I made a film with, with Mark Ruffalo in 2015 called uh, Dear President Obama. And uh, the, the clean energy revolution is now. And I toured it you know, around the country. Went, we filmed it in 20 states. I toured it everywhere. This is 2015. And the, you know, it was a, you know, an environmental energy related movie. In 2015 also, Leo DiCaprio made a film called After the Flood. Mm -hmm. He interviewed the Pope. He interviewed Obama. Uh, Naomi Klein made a movie, This Changes Everything. Uh, Charles Ferguson made a movie, a, a, an environmental movie. Charles Ferguson won the Academy Award for Inside Job. He made a, an environmental movie that cost $3 million that I can never remember the name of, but it's called Time to Choose. No one saw it by Charles' own intimation. Uh, Luc Jacquet, who made uh, March of the Penguins, made a movie called Antarctica, Ice and Sky. Uh, March of Pagans had won an Academy Award. Josh Fox made a movie that also I can never remember the name, How to Let Go in the, uh, in, of the World and Love All Things Climate Can't Change. And then our dear President Obama movie was out there all in the same year, all going after that same little thin slice of documentary filmmaking audience. Did the, all that energy, all that money, all that effort, did it make a difference? And did it, did it, especially in regard to I mean, climate change, look where we're at today. The, 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 the problem continues to grow and get worse. And there are more people, thankfully now today, new polls said that 79, 80% of Americans now believe that climate change actually does exist and is man-induced, 90-some percent of Democrats, and 60% of Republicans, which is a huge jump. So they're, they're, they're changing for some reason. And so I guess, you know, sim simple question, do documentary films, can documentary films make a difference? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I have no idea. <laughs> what I know is that your choices make a difference for yourself. And um, I think that's, okay, let's, make, let's take the example of environmental films, okay? Like the, most of the films, not all of them, but most of the films, of course, have a very a small sense of like empowerment, solution focused, but man, you, you finish a film, I mean, you watch a film and you just want to run away in a dark room and just like stay hidden, you feel terrible about yourself, and then the day after you wake up and you go back to your life because you have no choice and you keep doing the same all over again, right? So I think that it's all about um, how a film can actually show everybody that um, we, I see in the room, we are most of us um, white folks that are privileged people. What are we gonna do in order to put our privileged at the service of impacted communities? And how our work is going consistently, consistently and on the long run, empower specific communities that are already leading the way in order for them to implement the solutions on the, that are already implementing. How are we going to just support the people that are already making change? The change exists, but you know we prefer making like scaring people away instead of showing how actually change is already here. You know, very often we look, you know, at society, we don't look very far, and we say, "Oh, we are doomed." No, no, no. The solution is already here, and uh, you know, like we are going to make it, guys. It's okay. You know. The, the story is like how, like, do we want to make it okay for ourselves, or do you want to empower the people that are, you know, like making the difference? So I appreciate, you know, all your works, and that's what filmmaking is about. Not all of us do that, but film should show that social movement, social change comes from the ground, and that they are skilled enough to reach out to each to each other and, you know, bring about the change we all need. And ourselves, our job as you know privileged people is to use film as a tool in order to support the great work that's what's happening. Yeah. So yes, it can actually change a lot. No, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <coughs> and, and a big challenge for all of us is to get it beyond the church, to get it beyond the choir and show it to more and more Absolutely. persons. Yeah. 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 I, I think um, you know, my, my take on that is that you know, what we do is to try and bring awareness, right? And so 
this, uh, the, this just for my own story here with the, with the pollinators is to try and bring something that we had a general advantage because there's a general awareness among the population that there's a problem with bees, a lot of misinformation, and it's a complex problem. It's not one thing which people want to digest in one thing. But I've had, um, the, and this happened this afternoon after we had a screening, is that somebody came up to me and said, you know, I just planted a lawn and I should have put clover in it. And or so people were talking about taking out their lawns. And so these little steps that people uh, are doing, if I think if we use what we do as a way to kind of not lecture them, but just make them aware of what potential solutions are, what some people are doing, show by example. And people ask me, this happens regularly after our screenings, is that, you know, are you really hopeful? And I say, yeah, I am, I am hopeful. Because I do believe that the change is, is gonna come from the ground up. It's gonna come from our actions. We can't wait for our federal government to do it. It has to be done, started locally. And, and just with pollinators, you know, Olive is leading, uh, has a, a great pollinator protection program. The county just passed a pollinator projection, uh, protection program. Those, those came out of people. Those came out of us. And I think that that is, you know, sets the example. Then more, more counties, more municipalities want to do it. And I, and I really feel like that um, we, can, we can really make a difference if we can find that slot. And it's a lot of retail work, uh, as I call it, with, you know, getting out to film festivals and trying to engage with audiences and talk to it. And, you know, you... With me, if you push the beekeeper button, then it's hard to get me to shut up about bees. Um, so I apologize, but that's um, you know it's something that I am passionate about, and I do think that we can use what we do, our skills, to to make that change. Okay, I have sort of a cool, funny story to tell, if that's okay. Uh, I did a film a long time ago called Harlan County, USA, and it was about coal miners in Eastern Kentucky. It had its world premiere at the New York Film Festival. And I brought in, you know, coal miners and the women who were so forceful and so great um, on the picket lines. And so I did something, you know, totally different. We put the last song of the film in, in people's programs and had them sing it. And then all the coal miners' wives and coal miners came out, and Hazel Dickens sang. And um, and what happened was that Lois Scott, who's a character in the film who takes a gun out of her, you know, dress to show she's ready for anything, had just been made the local president of the Black Lung Association, and. Black lung is from is pneumocomiosis from the inhalation of coal dust. And so she gets on the stage and starts saying, I need to raise money to help the miners. And there we are, Alice Tully Hall, my first film ever, the world premiere, and people are throwing five and ten dollar bills on the stage. And I am in the back laughing as hard as I can through embarrassment and through everything. But she put me in my place. She said, she didn't realize she was my, she said, Barbara, you stop that laughing and stuff that money in your bra because we needed to help the miners. So mm -hmm. it can help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But these are, these are big issues we're talking about here, right? Yeah. Immigration, gun violence, regenerative agriculture, climate change. Uh, and so each of us, I think, does a little, little, little piece, which which goes a, a long way. Um, you know, a big part of documentary filmmaking now has, as is that next step, the social impact campaign. I mean, Cheryl, how are you going to use Parkland Rising, or how do you hope that Parkland Rising is used to help? change minds or influence or, or make a difference? Do yeah, um, I'm hoping that it will be a, a really a tool for uh, all of the people who are in the film. Uh, I've told them all that. It's, it is, uh, it's a, it will be available for them to uh, continue to spread their message. They can't be everywhere. You know, these, uh, these kids and these families, they poured their hearts out for 
a year and a half, you know, and, and sometimes people say, oh yeah, I remember those Parkland kids, you know, what are they doing now? They're still out there, they're still working as hard as they ever were. And uh, and I'm here with uh, Bill and Lori who were on the road with, uh, with these activists for, I mean, day in and day out, you know, as they went to rooms like this and schools and rallies all over the country, just trying to engage with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, and trying to register people to vote and trying to educate people. And, you know, they can only do that for so long and they have to go to college and they have to continue on with their lives. And and so in some ways, I hope that the film becomes something that, that can be where they're not, uh, that can be used by uh, all kinds of gun violence prevention groups, by schools, by colleges, by um, you know churches, communities, uh, and I've already been approached by a number of people just in the last couple of days saying, "We need this in my town. We need this. We'll sponsor a screening." And I am saying, "Yes." <laughs> and in simple terms, what's the what's the big ask of the film? And, and, and because it obviously in, involves politics. And I mean, is there something that that the film pre prescribes that can help this from continuing, or or, so, or is that too big? Well, it's. Uh, do you mean sort of a what can you do very prescriptively? Yeah, uh, but but recommended. I mean, if you when I walk out of the theater after seeing your film, am I going to call my congressman? Am I going to you know argue with my neighbors? What, what, am I going to encourage the school to get better? protections, I, I, I don't know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, I, you know, the, what's represented in the film is what the, the student activists themselves are saying, and there's nothing, you know, I haven't editorialized anything beyond that, uh, so they are pushing for people to get more politically involved. These kids, you know, it's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, they are so politically uh, informed and involved. They put a lot of adults to shame. Um, and they are advocating for everyone to register to vote, know who your your candidates are, know where they stand on guns, uh, and make that a priority. Be, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know that, that that's really been top of mind for a lot of people, so I hope that this will make it more top of mind. Like, let me check out where they stand, uh, you know, on guns. Um, so voting is definitely a message that comes across. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm beginning to think that the the trend that we're identifying with all these subject matters is that, right? It, it's more than more than any individual call for yes. changes in immigration laws or gun laws or it, it, they're or all related. Is is vote? Yes, right? they're they're all related, and they they all really um, are are issues where it's um, a choice of people choosing the environment. Uh, safety, health over uh, money for big corporations. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think we're gonna we're gonna invite some questions, but before I go to the audience, I'd kind of like these guys to weigh in. Do you guys have any questions for each other, or anything you'd like to uh, that we didn't talk about that you might? Yeah, I'd like to know from the other um, panelists how doing the the films that they do have changed them in their own life. Clément, yeah. go for it. Thank you for pronouncing my name properly. Uh, Clément. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna um, link what you were asking me with uh, the, your previous question, okay? So um, when I traveled and I was in production, uh, every time I was going and you know got acquainted with the community, we would actually uh, edit a very short video in order to support whatever work they were doing. And that's how I earned, uh, learned how to become a filmmaker, basically, and how I understood that my work was more than producing a film. So, you know, producing a film is good because you can, you know, touch, touch the mass, you can, you know, like, uh, get some maybe fame or visibility, you know, you can amplify voices, that's great. Uh, I think that's, Many films should be, you know, followed by a very thorough, well-structured, organized outreach campaign where uh, filmmakers work as part of a team with mar marketing professionals, with or community organizers to actually, you know, follow through. 
but very often you are burnt out, you know, like you produce this film, you're tired, you want to do something else, you know. And that's a pity sometimes, I think. So what, uh, what changed me, really, is that after doing this, um, this film, I'm pumped up, you know. I'm, uh, in November, we are uh, organizing three fundraisers, one in New York, one in San Francisco, one in Los Angeles, in order to really put together a very collective participatory outreach campaign in the whole continent uh, in order to uh, support community-based initiatives in order to better report on the impacts communities leave, how they can better reach out to other communities in order to support a movement. And I know that I am not the leader of that, but I know that I need to get involved in that and fundraise for communities that need those funds and those skills in order to really um, take for themselves the storytelling passion we have. So I'm organizing storytelling workshops all uh, everywhere, you know what I mean? And so how it changes me is that I am bringing my two babies, a two years old lady, Mia, and uh, a four months old boy, Lucas, and uh, with Sophie, my wife, we are going to have a bigger van this time. We are taking the two babies and just we are just hitting the road and get the work done so that our film is not, you know, good for TV or for just mass consumption, like advertisement. But yeah, man, we do the work. And for that, we need to be good at fundraising, <coughs> marketing, you know, follow up. And it's exhausting, but you know, I hope like more and more people will do that in the, in the business. Uh, I, I gained a new respect for these commercial beekeepers. Um, it was kind of uh, one of the great things about, I love about being involved in documentaries, particularly with other people um, directing or producing, is the fact that, you know, we have, I feel like I have the greatest job in the world, is that we get sort of parachuted into a world for a day, a week, a month, or a year, and meet these interesting people um, and get to enjoy their lives and experience their lives or um, just, learn about them and I and I love that and I with this film what really made me was really really made me change a little bit I think it was sort of connecting the dots between all these different things you know that to another level I mean I knew what happened with pollination but I didn't know the extent of it and how vulnerable it is and how you know when, when almost a hundred percent of our commercial bee population gets moved out to California every year that raises alarm bells for me, and um, that's kind of a scary prospect. And I, and I just, uh, it, it, I didn't realize how tenuous our food system is. I don't think we're going to starve. Don't worry, but our diet could be really worse, a lot worse, a lot less nutritious. And that, that was the thing that really, really changed for me was just how, how serious a subject this is. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in. I, 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 the thing that has changed me most in the last decade is really. I did turn a corner, because I, I was a long time journalist, I guess, both in print and filmmaking prior to, but about a decade ago, you know, I decided that I was old enough and experienced enough, I could make choices about, the sto real choices about, not just the stories I told, but whose, whose stories I told. And the people that I get inspired by mm -hmm. are what I call accidental environmentalists. You know, the people who have, you know, they have no intention of, of becoming an activist, especially a, an environmental activist, but then they've got a pipeline in their backyard, or their water's dirty, or the nuclear power plant next door is leaking, you know. And all of a sudden, they, they throw themselves into this 24-7. It's unbelievable. And they do it for years, you know, and I get so turned on by them. The movie we showed last year here, uh, uh, Ghost Fleet, uh, follows a woman who's made it her mission in life, a Thai woman who's made it her mission in life to find and repatriate these men who've escaped from these slave boats. And, but the, it, the, the story is not really about, uh, or what you can do is tricky in this one. It's not like uh, asking the server in the, in the restaurant, where does my tuna steak come from? Because the fish these guys catch is not that. The fish they catch is mostly turned into pet food. And we've had really good luck with the, with the film, really good success. It showed at the Vatican, it showed at the UN, but our most important screening is coming up uh, soon in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, and why Bentonville? Walmart. Walmart. Uh, the pet food industry in the United States is $30 billion a year. Walmart sells $10 billion of pet food a year. So 
and getting them to think about the supply chain is the most important thing for us. So that's a long-winded response. I think we're going to have some questions from the audience. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I, I feel like I sort of already uh, somewhat answered, but uh, I'll quickly say um, I have made an enormous a number of documentaries um, and uh, have always, you know, uh, tried to tell other people's stories as best I can, and, and we've covered every topic from, uh, uh, you know, people who uh, have neurofibromatosis, for example, and people going through a kidney transplant uh, procedure together, uh, did a film about um, transgender youth, and, and always just sort of tried to do my best to tell other people's stories. This is, for me, the first time where I felt very personally involved, very personally connected on, on a different level. An activist. And, and yes, and, and actually the first time where I said, I own this position, their message is my message, it is, we are one. Yeah. So that's how it changed me. I guess I always believe in uh, being intimate and sharing something and I've never shared this publicly, but this really changed me so much. Um, my family had a home in Yorktown Heights, New York, uh, for over a hundred years and the pipeline came in and decided they were gonna build a pipeline through the property. And for me, it was a place of roots. It was a place of memories. My great-grandmother and my grandmother planted every tree and you know, every flower and every bush. It's where I learned to swim two weeks after I was born. I was there every Christmas and Thanksgiving and summers. We would you know, always go there and I fought them for two years, across the street, they had put something called a pigging station at Spectre Energy, and um, which cleans the pipes and puts methane into the air, and then also a, a compressor that puts radon into the air. And of course, you know they condemned the land, did what they wanted, and. I guess I learned personally how hard it is to fight, but that you can't give up the fight. You know, I lost that fight, and I dream about this place, and I stop there along the way and trespass and pick lilacs and go down to the pond and just sit and hope I don't get caught for trespassing, but it can happen to any of us, and if we don't band together, and we don't do things that we think are important, not things that will overwhelm us, but just things that we individually believe in and join with other people. You know, we won't be able to do anything. We're so much more powerful when we stick together. Thanks. Into it? Okay, hi. Hi, um, thanks so much for the panelists' um, discussion points. I'm learning tons. Um, so as a New Yorker and hearing, and thanks so much for making Parkland Rising because I've had to write about high school shootings over the last couple of years myself and I've heard John talk a lot about, you know, what can you do? You call your assembly person, um, you talk to the Department of Education and what's the next step? You know, what, what will cure the epidemic, right, going on in the country? And so. I wanted to ask Cheryl, what do you think about, because I thought post-September 11th, they asked all the commuting class, you know, to start reporting things, mm -hmm. anything and everything. Don't leave any stone unturned. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought over and over in my head about that for kids. And how, how do you get them to almost kind of have that level of maturity like your kids are talking about becoming activists, where they, they start to report everything and anything. Yeah. You know, a friend in trouble, yeah. um, a, a graduate who's gone, who keeps coming back and it seems odd, or, you know, a, a tryst going on, a fight going on, something hidden that they don't share with the school counselor or the, pr or the principal at all, or, or even their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get them to feel comfortable that they won't get punished for just reporting everything and anything so where they can save lives? 
I can only speak to, you know, I said I have three teenagers. I can only speak with the experience with mine. Um, they, in their school, they are all very quick to report things that they see on social media. Sometimes they, they think that the uh, reaction by administrators can be extreme and unnecessary because the second a, a kid posts something where they're threatening anyone in any way, the police are at the school. Um, and so the kids go, oh, this is ridiculous. But I, I question, you know, we're at this point because we have to fear that any kid can get an AR-15. That's why we have to act that way. And so, you know, if I, so there are all these things that people talk about. We should make schools safer. We should have bulletproof glass. We should have uh, metal detectors outside of schools. And to me, it all just misses the point. The, the point is, People shouldn't have AR-15s. <laughs> we, we should deal with that problem, uh, and then we won't have all these other problems. Uh, the broad question that I have is, with the proliferation of video and the ability for anybody to edit, um, has that caused, led you to up your gains in terms of production? Um, and be very, very conscious of, of the, the role of what you're doing. The more narrow question I have is for Barbara. Mm -hmm. Is there a part of you that was relieved when Woodstock 50 got called off? Yeah, Peter, take the, take the technical question. <laughs> um, as, it, as a cinematographer, maybe. Yeah, as a, yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting. When I started, um, as a camera assistant before I was a, a cameraman and a director of photography, um, we had to learn film. You know, we shot film. And so there's a big learning curve and there's a real craft involved with that, which I think um, helps me to this day for, for uh, in terms of, you know, having a craft and it's what I believe that I do. Um, but I'm also very excited about the democratization of the storytelling through technology. and. Sometimes I, I get a little peeved when somebody goes into B&H Photo and buys a $3,000 camera and calls himself a director of photography. <laughs> On the other hand, people are allowed to tell stories now, not allowed, but they have the ability to tell stories now that they could never tell before because of all the barriers, uh, technology and otherwise. Um, and so I think that there are many voices out there. And it has, um, I don't think about whether it, it, um, I've had to up my game. I think a good story is a good story. And um, I think that that rules everything. If you have a good story and characters, that, you know, if you can get it technically, um, I think that's, you know, really important. However, I would say the one thing that is often overlooked is good sound. And um, sound is really important because you can always put pictures over sound. But sound, and I say this as a cameraman, is I, I listen more, you know, more than a lot of people to what's going on around me, not only to know what I'm doing, but also because it's important, you know, Rolodex for me as a cameraman. But you can also, the sound, I think, is overlooked a lot of times in some of these films. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's my thought on it. Uh, I totally agree with you. I was a sound recordist on all my films for 17 years. And I always wear now, which all of you should do too, it, maybe, is a Comtex, and that allows you to hear everything that's going on and everything that's recorded on certain tracks, and you don't miss anything. And you could put one earphone on and then the other one off so you can hear what's happening somewhere else. It's so key and so important. I mean, sound is very important to me. And I just figure that if you go into the field and you work so hard to get people to open up and get people to say things that they care about, you better have a really great technical team that's going to make sure it's going to look good and sound good. So totally agree. Woodstock 50. I'm very sad it didn't happen. I wanted to go. I wanted to film it. I wanted to be part of it. I think. You know, everybody tried so hard to make it happen, and I hope that, you know, Michael and others pull something out of the bag that continues to celebrate that wonderful coming together of so many people. So. 
Yes, they targeted Mike, and he didn't deserve it. I don't think he's a really good, close friend, and he tried so hard, and I'd text him and say, okay, do you think this is happening? And he'd say, well, I have to write the ship. I have to write the ship. So I think it's always wonderful to have something that we can all get together with in community and ritual to be together to celebrate. Um, thank you. I just want to say your films are, were tremendously impactful, and thank you so much for being here. And it's an honor to see your films. We, if someone wants to host your um, uh, screenings, um, do you have? Is it on your websites? Um, are your um, films accessible to to buy for to distribute for for people to do screenings? Is that for everyone? But yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would say for me, uh, just I, I'll give you a contact. Um, and yes, for me, it's all about getting it out there and arranging screenings, like I said. So it, while it won't be available online yet, I'm happy to work with anyone and everyone to set up screenings all over the country. So that's a yes for me. <laughs> Yeah, the um, uh, pollinators.net is our website, and on there, there's ways to uh, link to requesting screenings um, for we can bring that film to communities. And we're going to have a, a screening in Rosendale on November 6th. It's going to be one of several hundred cities on that day, and it's kind of an innovative, kind of crowdsourced way to get independent films out there, which we're really excited about. And uh, so I'd encourage you to, to, um, to go to pollinators.net and, and and the company who's doing it is Demand Film, and they—it's um, a really interesting new model because it's hard for indie docs to get out there. And that's phase one of with our film that we're going to ultimately we will broadcast, stream, and then have uh, educational markets for it. Yeah. And, and Barbara, do you have a plan for New Homeland in terms of distribution or accessibility? Uh, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show it. We want to show it wherever we can, uh, schools, everywhere. And so we're working on that now. So absolutely, yes. The same here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think wanted... we're living up to the fiercely independent uh, logo here, <laughs> motto. I wanted to speak to the um, issue about distribution and um, the idea of how to saturate the portals, you know, how to get the information out there. Um, so I had kind of two questions. One is there's the passion of the filmmakers. How do you also link up with the business community to find where their passion lies, like the distributors, you know, to be able to match that passion of the filmmaking, passion of the message with the passion of getting it out there, mm -hmm. the distributors. The other thing I wanted to tell you was that, that you might already know, there's a thing called the 100th monkey syndrome, and it's the idea that uh, once 100 monkeys uh, learned one task, it went like wildfire through the whole herd and everybody knew it. So it's the idea that once you reach a critical mass of understanding and awareness that it just mushrooms and goes into common knowledge, RPI, right up the road in Troy, did a study on that 100th monkey syndrome and proved it that if you can reach 10% of the population with a message, then it becomes common knowledge. So sitting right here in the Hudson Valley, Woodstock Film Festival, where it's such a unique position because we have 52 million people from here down in our population. Mm. So the Woodstock Film Festival and what happens here is really important because you now have access to 52 million people. There's only 350 million taxpayers in the United States. So this is a huge hub for that to happen. And just to let you know, saturate the portals. Yes, yeah. you have to work with all of your team. Saturate every portal of where you think your audience is going to be. Our so first my, my suggestion would be to, to watch these films, because keeping in mind that this is the first time anyone's seen Clement's film. It's the first time anyone's seen Cheryl's film. Mm -hmm. It's almost the first time people have seen Barbara and, and uh, Peter's films. And I have a feeling, uh, knowing the the documentary circuit a little bit that these, these films are going to rise to the top of the, the heap and that they're going to get a lot of attention and uh, I think it'll and get a wi wide audience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I also wanted to say that I come from a time when documentaries meant nothing. Mm. And um, you'd be at a party or something, and somebody would say, well, what do you do? And you'd say, oh, I make documentaries. i say, I think I'll go get another drink or something. <laughs> <laughs> and life has changed so much. This is a go sort of a golden age, as people have said, about documentaries. And people are craving for this information. And it's entertaining, it's funny, it's sad, you know, it really tells good stories. And I just feel that we can get our films out, we can get them to a large amount of people because people want to see them and there's so many different avenues now to be able to show them on. National Geographic on television is now showing documentaries. You have covered everything from, I mean, in my limited knowledge, from a scary reaction to a coal miner strike to the mud people where I met you. <laughs> um, what would you think of covering the Lakota Nation's Freedom Ride? Their issue is a pipeline going through their um, ancient burial grounds, like your backyard. I've been wanting to, I thought of you when I was involved. Uh, I think people are doing a film on that. You know more about it, but I know that they have been, and they've been shooting since the very beginning of everybody coming together. Yeah. You know what I, yeah. you know what I like about what, uh, the, the pipeline movement? It's actually, you know, the, the rise of the uh, climate justice movement like as a global movement came from the realization that pipelines actually, you know, link up people, tie people together. So it's not only about, you know, one community's impact about the pipeline, it's how communities realize that pipelines are a collective issues and there is more than one community impacted by a pipeline. So the cake cell pipeline at the time is what made uh, climate justice a global movement because it would link together northern Canada down to Houston and all the communities along. So I appreciate what you're saying. I don't say that it, it doesn't make sense, but what makes, I think, more sense is to understand that pipelines and, and environmental issues actually bring people together more than they impact isolated communities. The goal is to go beyond the sense of isolation, you know? Yeah. Sorry? It can be rerouted, but it's more expensive. I think we have time for one more question. And Thank it's you. me. <laughs> this is a naive question, but are any of you on Twitter? Yes. Have you ever thought about using Periscope while you're on Twitter? I mean, what a great way to introduce your film, because it would be an you would be more or less talking about what we talked about today, what you talked about today. And, you know, people retweet it and they get to see the filmmaker and hear your story. So it's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. So she, one, one more simple question. She promises it's simple. I'm so afraid that this will be lost, lost. And the, similar the, to the, the 19, 2015 movies that you were speaking about. And I'm wondering, is it, how can one follow you folks? Simply put in the name of your movie with .org, and Pretty then we can find out where to find. I mean, I haven't seen your movies. Yeah, I've been busy I, working, sure. doing other things, and I want to see them. Sure. I don't want them to disappear. So how do I keep in touch with? For, uh, it's probably the names of the movies or the names of the directors. And you put that yeah, in yeah, for, for me, com. it's Parkland Rising. We uh -huh. have a website. There's some uh, fresh press out there, so not too hard to find. And, and the, the newsletter that the festival does does a pretty good job of, of letting people know when, when films are out and about. And, and most of them, all of them, will soon be on the web at some juncture. So. But I also want to share it with other folks, because that's the whole point, to get yeah, it out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So do I tell people so to go to... It's I social to media. It's, it's called social media. Yeah. Yeah. You just type the yeah. name of the, the yeah. films, that's and it. then you can share with yeah. people. And then I can get the connections yeah. right there. But as Barbara says, okay. you know, people now less and less run away from you when you say you're a documentary that's filmmaker. Yeah, but true. also the, the change in, in, in access to social media has changed the way we, people can access these films incredibly. 
So, uh, you know, just as we are very happy to be last in the programming because they mirror is saved best for last, we now have to go because everyone's got trains to catch us and buses to catch, et cetera. So thank you very much. Thank you.